Uh, so this is part two of chapter 34, the beginning of salvation objective aspects. So I did Union with Christ in part one. This is part two, justification and adoption. There are certain theological terms that like you just never use outside of theology and justification is one of those. It's a huge theological term. And it's one of these places where the if you ever run across the term justification, it means to give a justification of what you did. Like, how come you did that? And you give a justification. I did that because, and that is totally, totally opposite to the biblical meaning. So put on your put your English over there on the side somewhere, put your theology vocabulary side because this is one of those big terms and it's an important term, but we need to understand it because the foundational truth is so critically important. Uh, justification is just as a basic term uh, is the idea that uh, God's declaration that we are accepted as his children, forgiven of our sin and pardoned from condemnation. I mean, that, that's the dimensions of it. And you can divide it up. Uh, Dr. Erickson divides up in justification and adoption, but they're, they're really two sides of the same coin. God's declaration, and it's a declaration by grace alone through faith alone, uh, that we have been forgiven of sin, pardoned of condemnation, and then the adoption piece is accepted as his children. Now, we need to unpack this a little bit because this is, this is a place where back in the 16th century, uh, Martin Luther and the Roman Catholic Church had a big falling apart, is what is it that justification means. And uh, so in those days, uh, justification was understood to be God making you righteous. And from a Roman Catholic perspective, when you're baptized, that you are made righteous by the sacramental act of baptism. That'd be a little bit like what we call regeneration. So from their perspective, you're justified at one level by the act of baptism, but then what you have to do is because you're in a world where there's sin and you corrode that cleansing work of baptism, is you have to do works of penance in order to re-cleanse yourself and you can't get into uh, heaven until you're completely cleansed, and you have to work really hard to do that. And if you don't do it just right, you will lose your justifying grace and go to hell. So huge debate, and that had a lot to do with the corruption of the church, the indulgences, the just selling of salvation, literally for money, so they could build St. Peter's Cathedral and big hurrah in church history, another class. And what Martin Luther did was he said, no, 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 it's not, 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 not a making clean. It's a declaring that you're righteous. Uh, so that's a question is, is, is when you talk about justification, is it a making righteousness or is it a declaring righteousness? And... Uh, We'll have to play with that a little bit. Let's just look at some passage in Scripture. The place where this comes up is in uh, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. This is the thesis of the whole book of Romans. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also the Greek. For the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, it is written, the righteous shall live by faith, foundational things. So he's talking about salvation, he's talking about belief, the righteousness of God is given from faith, and you live by faith. Now skip over to chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 21. We get that same thing again. The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. That's the Mosaic law. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe... There's no distinction. All sin falls short of the glory of God, for we are justified. There's the key term, Romans 3.24. We are justified by his grace as a gift through redemption in Christ Jesus. And then goes ahead and talks about what he's doing. 
Now, the question is, what is happening here? Righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ for believers, and we're justified by his grace as a gift. Now, Protestant understanding, biblical, my understanding, is that that righteousness is a declaration, not a transformation. Though in regeneration there is a transformation, it's not the justification piece. Why would I say that? Well, it has to do with how the word is used. And this is where we have to do just a little bit of a word study uh, to understand what the word means. So if I go back and look at the Old Testament, and let's look at some key passages there where justification is used. Look at Exodus 23.7. Exodus 23.7. Uh, Exodus 23.7. Do you have that? Exodus 23.7. So it's talking about justice here. It says, keep far from false charge. Do not kill the innocent and the righteousness, for I will not acquit, the SV says, the wicked. And that word acquit is justify. So if you look at some other translations, it's going to say justify. But that word acquit uh, is tzadik. Uh, and here, because that's what it means, justify, I will not justify the wicked means I will I will not free them from charge. It's a it's a forensic context is a big term, a, a courtroom context. And uh, God says, I will not justify, acquit the wicked. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, look at Deuteronomy 25. Deuteronomy 25, verse 1. If there's a dispute between men, they come into court, the judges decide between them, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. Now, again, that word is tzaddik, that's the word we translate as justify in other contexts. And here again, it's very clear what that is, a courtroom context. A good judge justifies the innocent and condemns the guilty. What is the work here? Uh, acquitting or justifying and condemning are Declarity works by a judge, and when you stand before a judge, you're determined, did you do it? And if so, the judge says, yep, you did it, you are condemned. Or he says, nope, jury says you didn't do it, so you're free. And that's a courtroom environment, and that's the context of justification. Deuteronomy 25. One more, Proverbs 17.15. Proverbs 17.15. This is a funny story. Talking here about uh, wisdom and righteousness here in Proverbs. Proverbs 17, 15, so it's a little proverb. He who justifies the wicked, or acquits the wicked, and he who condemns the righteousness are an abomination before the Lord. Huh. So this is kind of the opposite of what we just saw. The righteous judge condemns the guilty and justifies the, wick, uh, the innocent. Here, the one who justifies the wicked and condemns the righteous is, are an abomination. Okay, got that. So what is the act of, of justification? It's a declaration of guilty or not guilty. Okay, now look at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, uh, verse 2. If Abraham was justified by works, so it's justification, declaration, guilty, not guilty. If he is justified, proven to be right by his works, he has something to boast about, but, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted him to righteousness. Now the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but is his due. So if I earn justification, if I earn acquittal, it's me that's doing it. <laughs> Look at verse 5. To the one who does not work, but who believes in him who justifies the ungodly. Remember what it said in Proverbs 17? It said the one who justifies the wicked is an abomination. Here it says God justifies the ungodly. What does it say about God? He's an abomination. 
he's doing something that is absolutely wrong, taking it at face value. Like, what's the deal? How can God be an abomination? How can God do what's un ungodly? Well, he doesn't, of course. The thing of it is here is how do you get to be justified? How do you get to be declared innocent in God's courtroom? And the answer is you believe in the work that Jesus Christ has done. And because of that belief, you're declared innocent. You're declared not guilty, actually, to be more correct. The condemnation that was there because of my evil deeds has been released, and I'm declared not guilty. I'm released from the condemnation that comes from my works. How come? Well, chapter 3, of course, is talking about Jesus, who is the propitiation uh, for our sins. He took the penalty for our sin. And when I put my faith in him, this is saying God justifies, God declares righteous the ungodly person. How can he do that? Because penalty for my sin taken by Christ into his work so that I can have the freedom that comes from that. It is just absolutely astonishing. Just absolutely astonishing. Uh, let's look at a couple more passages here. Romans chapter 9, verse 30. Romans 9, verse 30. Uh, what shall we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness by faith. So Gentiles do bad things, but they believe, so they have righteousness. But Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but by works. So you see the difference here. If I try to prove myself before God to be a good guy, it ain't going to work. If I accept by faith the work that Jesus Christ did for me, then I'm declared not guilty because the penalty is taken by Christ. Galatians chapter 2. Big, big, oh my gosh. So powerful. Verse 15, Galatians 2, 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. We're not justified by keeping the Abrahamic commandments, the 613 commandments. We're not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So if I try to do all the commandments and take the 613 plus all the ones in the Talmud plus all the ones in our churchy culture, if I try to keep those things to come before God and say, hey, I'm a good guy. I deserve to be in your kingdom. I deserve to be declared not guilty. It's not going to work. But those who believe in Christ Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will ever be justified. You can't do it. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? No, no, no. See, here's the point. I'm justified and declared not guilty, but I'm still sinning. That's the contrast. The point here is I'm declared not guilty because Jesus Christ has taken the penalty for my sin so that I can receive his forgiveness, complete forgiveness. And that's what justification is. Therefore, you can say in this huge verse in chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. So the death of Jesus Christ is a part of my history as a person. It's no longer I who live, because I died there, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live uh, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved and gave himself for me. So I can, I can be confident in my not being guilty, not being condemned, being declared not guilty, because I'm trusting that Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection did that work. That's the heart of justification. Um, that's the heart of justification. Um, well, what about works? Like, do I have to do anything good? No. 
no, no, no. Look at James chapter 2. This is a kind of a challenging passage, but we have to look at it. James chapter 2. He's talking about Abraham here. <clears throat> James 2, 14. What is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but not have work, can that faith save him? Uh, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed, lacking daily food, and one says, hey, you've got to get some food, is that faith? Is that any good? Faith by itself, it does not have works, he's dead. Someone say, you have faith, I will have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show my faith by your works. Do you believe God is one? Like, the demons do that. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? So you say faith was active along with his works, and his faith was completed by his works. A lot of people said that Paul and James contradict each other. They don't. They don't. They don't. Paul, in the passage we looked at in Romans 4, is talking about his belief in chapter 15, where he trusts God in his promise, and Abraham, God says, that is righteousness. And he is declared not guilty back in chapter 12. What James is talking about is that kind of faith that trusts God's promise will have an impact on a person's life because the faith is not just by itself. It comes with regeneration as well. So in chapter 22 of Genesis, way after chapter 15, we see that Abraham, when he's commanded by God, again, to do the unthinkable, to kill his own son. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, but God, in this unique way, commands him to kill his son as a prophecy of what the father's going to do to his son on that same mountain, Mount Moriah. And Abraham, because he trusts God, does what God commands him to do, and that shows the depth of his faith. One more passage in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Uh, starting at, well, the start of verse 5. He saved us not because of works done righteous, but according to his own mercy, the washing regeneration. And then verse 7. So that being justified by his grace, there it is, justified by his grace, not by our works, not by works done in righteousness. He saved us not because of works done in righteousness, but because of his grace and our faith. We're just by grace, might become heirs according to hope of eternal life. But verse 8, this saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things, that you believed in God, there's the faith, may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Like how come? What's the connection? If justification is simply a declaration not guilty, and it is, by itself, what's the connection with works? Well, we see it here. Justification doesn't come by itself. Justification is an external not guilty, but at the same time we get a regeneration, new heart, indwelling Holy Spirit. Those both come. And because our justification gives us a new family membership with our union with Christ, I have a new identity. I'm a child of God. I have a new set of desires out of my regeneration. I want to do good things. I have a new power source, the indwelling Holy Spirit. I have a new community, the community of Christ. And so I am careful to devote myself to good works. Why? Not to earn my justification but as a fruit of that justification. Just like repentance, a change of allegiance, the fruit of repentance is good works. The fruit of faith and justification is good works because my identity changes, my desires change, my powers change. One more verse, Titus 2.11, going back just a little bit. Titus 2.11, the grace of God appeared, brings salvation to all people, What's that grace do? It trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright. Our great God and Savior, 
who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. See, good works is not the foundation, not the ground, not the reason of justification, but if I am justified, I'm also regenerated, and out of that newness will come a desire to be like Christ. And that's this final point, is the adoption piece. And that adoption piece is just so important because that's a piece that comes with it. That's the union with Christ piece. So when I look at that, if I look at Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, it says here as Paul's talking about this, it's it's just an amazing thing. I become an heir. When he's a child, is no different than a slave. But when he grows up, then you... Well, verse 6, this is the adoption piece. Because we are sons, God sent his son, his spirit in our hearts, so we cry out, Abba, Father, we're no longer a slave, but a son, an inheritor. What do you have to do to get there? Well, again, look back just a little bit here in Galatians. How do you get there? Verse 27, many as you baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew, Greek, slave, free, male, male, female. There's only one in Christ. If you are Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to his promise. That's that adoption piece. One last passage, John chapter 1, verse 12, John 1, 12. Uh, It's talking about the people to whom he came. He came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. But then the promise to all who did receive him, all who received Jesus and his free gift of salvation, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's who you are. That's who you are. So we've been declared not guilty, justification. We've been declared children of God, adoption. Somebody can put those together there. They're external to us. They don't change me, but they come in context of the regeneration that does change me. So justification, I've got a new identity, child of God. Regeneration, I've got a new set of desires. I've got indwelling Holy Spirit. Part of that justification is being our adoption, is putting in the body of Christ. So I've got a new community. So I've got new identity, new desires, new power, new community. And out of all that comes this Christ. I want to enjoy the fullness of his blessing. I want to enjoy every spiritual blessing. I want it in, to become holy and blameless by his power. He who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ. And that's the outcome of that. So, union with Christ, regeneration, justification, adoption, they all come as a package by grace alone through faith alone. And what a change. Thank you.